now I would like to introduce Dr. Natasha Rudenko. Uh, she will be presenting Molecular Biology and Ecology of Ticks and Tick-Borne Pathogens, Coexistence, Distribution, and Interactions. Uh, Dr. Rudenko is a Deputy Head of Laboratory of Molecular Ecology of Vectors and Pathogens at the Institute of Parasitology of Biology Center Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic. So my name is Natasha Rodenka, and as you might guess, uh, I'm not Irish, uh, I'm not Scottish, I'm not British, I came from the Czech Republic. But I'm not Czech either. I'm Ukrainian, so forgive me the lack of proper accent. I'm not here long enough. So I will be talking about some basic stuff and about our research that we've been doing for years and things that uh, more or less are connected to Lyme disease. So the presentation will be Lyme disease connected. Molecular ecology of ticks and tick-borne disease. Ticks and the pathogens that they transmit uh, constitute a growing burden for the public health and uh, the health of animals as well. For millions of years, ticks uh, managed to live and coexist, co-evolve with multiple pathogens from uh, such as bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and helminths. And it came to the point when ticks became a very successful vectors of uh, those pathogens. Actually, ticks are second after mosquitoes uh, successful vectors by the number of pathogens that they can transmit. Tick can survive thanks to the blood feeding and the blood that they are sucking from a uh, host. And uh, besides the direct damage that can be done um, by uh, just making a holes in a skin, which is sometimes, depending on a tick species, can be very serious. So ticks uh, damage the host by excreting the toxin via the saliva. And uh, actually, the highest uh, damage is done by the pathogens that are transmitted by the ticks. Some factors about the ticks. So, now, if you don't mind, I still somehow like this, so to see. So maybe I can use a microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it works. So, all ticks are obligate non permanent blood feeders. Tick hosts include all terrestrial vertebrates. Ticks are vectors of more kind of uh, microorganism than any other arthropod taxon. Distribution, from Arctic to Antarctic. Today, more than 900 tick species exist and recognized, and 10% of them are of concern to human health. The most important genera of human biting ticks are Amblyoma, Dermacenter, Hamophysalis, Hyaloma, Ixodus, and Drypetcephalus. The capacity of tick for active migration is very limited. The questing larva usually can move up to 20 centimeters. Nymphs up to 40, 50, and adult up to one meter. So it means the distribution of uh, the ticks is closely related to migration of the host. Reservoir host of uh, different tick species represent mammals, rodent, birds, lizards. And actually different pathogen uh, uses uh, those species asymmetrically. It means that if the animal, the vertebrate, is a reservoir host for one pathogen, it doesn't mean that it can be a, a reservoir uh, host for another pathogen. Reservoir host of Borrelia burgdorferi sensulata. Lyme disease parakeet can infect diverse animal species, but not all of them serve as competent uh, hosts. Efficient reservoir host of Borrelia burgdorferi sensulata and other pathogens share several characteristics. They are abundant. They are present in, naturally, uh, they are present in a big number and uh, naturally infected and serves as host for numerous vector-competent ticks. They do not usually become resistant to repeated tick feeding. It means that multiple generations of different ticks can feed on them again and again and again and again. They are readily infected and remain infected and infective to competent tick vectors for a long period of time, sometime often for a lifetime. This is a small presentation of asymmetrically, uh, uh, as asymmetrical response of vertebral serum to Borrelia burgdorferi sensulata. We did it in our lab. Uh, in 2016, and we've been testing Braille Labrador Free and Census Stricta, right here. 
Borrelia garinii and Borrelia afzelae, uh, the sensitivity of those species to the serum of exotic animals. So we collected the sample from uh, different uh, zoos and just did the serum sensitivity test and you can see how the sensitivity and uh, or resistance of pathogen distributed. On the top of the list, sorry, maybe you can, cannot read it, this is a rabbit, and on the bottom is a crocodile. So the dark gray uh, the, the lines represent the animals that are resistant to all three species. It means that there is no way that you can infect, let's say, a rabbit with sensu stricta, garinia, afzeli, but uh, this, uh, the rabbit is very, uh, sensitive to Borrelia andersonii. If you're talking about crocodile, it can be infected with any one of those. The human is some here, right here. So as you can see, it's very sensitive to sensu stricta and abzali. Sometimes it can resist to uh, uh, garini, but not always. Different multiple species can be resistant to garini and abzali, but can be infected by sensu stricta. So the difference is very definite in here. So let's say zebra, different kind of zebras, they are resistant to Garini and Avzeli, but can be easily infected by sensu stricta. And th this works for multiple pathogens and for multiple hosts as well. There are four bridge vectors that are of uh, medical importance for human. Ixodes rhizonus and Ixodes persicatus in Europe and Asia, and Ixodes capillaris and Ixodes pacificus in North America. However, in addition to those bridge vectors, it means the vectors that definitely transmit pathogen from infected host to the human through the tick bite. The numbers of different tick species that are very important in different areas as maintenance vectors. Maintenance, it means that uh, they really invest a lot to support uh, the presence and existence of a pathogen population in specific areas. So multiple species of exodus in Europe, in the USA, Japan, Korea, China, and Seoul. So according to Jim Oliver, in some area maintenance vector appear to be more important in the anzotic cycle of Brele than the bridge vector. You might know this picture, this looks very neat and clean. The distributions of four uh, major vectors, human biting vectors in, around the world. So in the United States, it's Exodus Pacificus in the west, Exodus Capillaris on the eastern coast and mid-central, Exodus Ricinus and Exodus Persulcatus with some overlap. But unfortunately, the situation is not so clear and not so easy. When you check the United States, there are a couple of other human biting tick species that feed on the same uh, reservoir host that bridge vectors, and that can transmit any pathogen to a human, sometimes more successfully, sometimes no. So if you, if we get back to here, there is no such thing as an empty place in the United States without tick species. The same situation in Europe. In addition to Ixodes region distribution and Ixodes persicatus, there is Dermacenter reticulatus and Hyaloma marginatum, a human biting tick that can transmit multiple pathog pathogens to humans as well. Ticks are transmitting a quite a huge number of different viruses that are dangerous for human and animal health. 95% of uh, life cycle, those viruses are uh, spent in the ticks. They are multiplying in midgut. They go through the hamalim to the salivary glands uh, just to be able to infect the human during the tick bite. When we check the list of pathogens, other pathogens and virus, uh, concerning the four major vector, vectors of medical importance and the rest of human biting tick species, you will see that it's definitely, as Leona said, it's not just Lyme, it's not just Borrelia burdufri sensulata. Anaplasma, Borrelia burdufri sensulata, Borrelia miyamota, Bartonella species, Babesia, Coxella, Francisella, so you can read, I, I'm not going to read it all, you will read it by yourself, but this is definitely not about sensu lata. And very often there was a question, how is it possible that multiple pathogens survive in tick at some of the some competition? During some time, some Russians, Russian scientists discussed the 
existence of so-called one-sided antagony. They were dealing with uh, a lot of tick-borne encephalitis virus in uh, Eastern Russia and really were the encephalitis bracket. And for once, sometimes they thought that actually the presence of Lyme virus bracket keeps virus from replication and transmission, reduces the viability of the virus. From the other side, the presence of virus in a tick actually promotes transmission of Borrelia replication as just going out of vector. But lately, it was proved that there is no such thing. Multiple pathogens that are present in the same tick, they will find their own place in a tick body, and they will survive happily without any competition. And actually, it doesn't matter how much or how many pathogens are present in the tick. Neither one of them are really interested of damaging this vector because this is the way how they survive. And this is the way how they go from infected ticks to another new host. Two years ago, a group of authors, including us, published a paper where we were trying to find the molecular drivers of tick-borne pathogen diseases. And there were a couple of them that we defined using the literature study. Host range. Tick with a wide host range, such as exodus reasons, are naturally exposed to a greater variety of pathogens compared to ticks with a narrow host range, uh, such as Rivicephalus micropolis. Another determinant, number of hosts. Saying shortly, the more hosts are involved in a tick self-life, the higher is possibility to transmit the pathogen to the bigger number of hosts. Innate immune response. Pathogens need to overcome tick defense mechanism, such as the phagocytosis of microbes by hematocytes, antimicrobial peptides, and RNA interference in order to be transmitted with tick saliva. Midgut infection and escape barrier. The pathogens need to pass through the midgut to reach the salivary glands and to be transmitted uh, with tick saliva. And this mechanism involves actually molecules present as in ticks, so as in vector. Tick receptor for os os oh, sorry, excuse me. Tick receptor for OSP A on in a tick and OSP A outer surface protein A in Borrelia burgdorferi. This is a pair that works for this purpose. Salivary gland infection and escape barrier. Pathogens must cross into the salivary glands for transmission with saliva during feeding, but little is known about the molecular mechanism behind this entry. Once inside the salivary gland, the pathogen has to be released into the saliva stream to be transmitted. For example, Borrelia burgdorferi uses tick sal salivary proteins to facilitate infection of to the mammalian host. Actually, sometimes tick proteins, uh, namely salivary gland protein 15, salt 15, it's actually protect Borrelia uh, by himself from being destroyed in the blood uh, of infected host. Pathogen strains. Differences between pathogen strains to infect and be transmitted by ticks have been widely reported. Tick microbiome pathogen interaction. So my, micro, uh, microbiome is kind of very modern uh, subject recently, and actually the importance in different mechanisms uh, was already confirmed. So in case of uh, transmission of pathogens, it plays an essential role in various aspects of the arthropod life cycle, and there is an increasing interest to elucidate arthropod microbiome interaction. Perturbation of the microbiome causes changes in integrity of the peritrophic membrane and may affect pathogen infection. Cross-immunity interference. Competition between microorganisms within the tick may affect vector competence. Ticks infected with one rickettsia species were, for instance, refractory through for to transparent passage of the second species. The same thing is known for Borrelia burgdorferi sansolata spiricate. Tick uh, or host cannot be infected with the same uh, strain twice, but it doesn't uh, protect the host to be infected with another species, species of Lyme disease spiracate. And abiotic factors. Abiotic factors such as temperature and relative humidity not only have a different a direct effect on tick development, questing activity, and longevity, but temperature may also modulate pathogen development and survival in ticks. 
So this is a picture from that review where we were dealing with five different organisms. And if you can see, Borrelia Lyme disease, which is number two, is present almost everywhere where the pathogens were uh, studied. There are rare areas in the world where it's not present yet. And talking about <laughs> the presence of Borrelia burgdorferi sensulata complex in Europe, this is a review paper from Augustine Pena, Augustine Estrada Pena from 2011, and that was the distribution of known for that moment Borrelia burgdorferi sensulata species, which is actually a little bit old for the moment. As for today, 22 named sparrowhead species from Borrelia burgdorferi sensulata complex were recognized around the world. Out of those, 10 are pathogenic or potentially pathogenic to human health. And namely, those highlighted with dark orange, Borrelia abzelae, bavariensis, bisetiae, sensu stricta, gariniae, and myoni. Those are six uh, species that definitely were uh, detected, isolated, uh, and isolated from human patients. And there is no doubt that they are the causative agents of Lyme disease worldwide. Borrelia, Kurtenbachia, Lusitania, Spilmani, Valaisiana. There were cases where the pathogens were detected. Some of them, even the cases uh, where they were isolated. But uh, the number of cases is really low, and very often those species just overlooked as a reason of Lyme disease. And unhighlighted Americana, Andersoni, Californiensis, Carolinensis, Japonica, Sinica, Tanuki, Turdi, Yangtze, Finlandensis, Chilensis, and the very last, Borrelia LNA. Uh, until today, there was no direct evidences that will connect those species with human Lyme disease. Distribution around the world. 13 years ago, Klaus Kunterbach published this paper and everything looks so nicely. So there were just two species, Sensu stricta and Bisetti, for uh, North America and a little bit more for Europe, Sensu stricta, Garini, Abzeli, maybe some uh, Bisetti, Lusitania, and strains in Japan, Tanuki, Turdi, and Japonica. Eight years ago, Gabby Margos published this, this paper, and as you can see, the mass with distribution is a little bit higher, and the multiple new species appeared. Andersoni, Gertenbachi, Californiensis, Americana, and Carolinensis that we described, Borrelia Bissetti uh, were found in Europe and in, here, in North America as well, Valenciana, Spilmani, and the rest of species. Borrelia bavariensis already was separated from uh, Borrelia garinii uh, sparicate as and was named as uh, individual species. This is how it looks now. Actually, when you can see Borrelia finlandensis, Borrelia myoni, Borrelia lanei, Borrelia chilensis, those are four newly described species around the world. If you check the migration, so Borrelia garinia was detected in Canada. We detected Borrelia garinii in Rodenhorst in southeastern United States. We detected Borrelia abzerli in the same space as well. Borrelia bavariensis uh, was detected in patient in uh, United States, I think it's mid-central. Mid Borrelia valenciana was detected in a uh, lady in human patient who never traveled anywhere. And Borrelia americana and Borrelia carolinensis, both species from North Carol uh, South Carolina, southeastern United States, were detected in Europe and in China as well. So this is actually just a matter of time, according to us, when the distribution of those pathogens will be even wider. As far as such event as migrating of animals exist, those species will be distributed as well. And the main way how it goes, this is a bird fly flyways. Flyways generally span over continents and orphans, and each of them, actually the main road of millions and millions and millions birds that can uh, go from one point to the other, and the overlap of all those five aves gives the possibility or the chance, like it's like you're changing the train and the species will change the continents using this species. 
But in addition to this very natural way, we actually detected the existence of human, um, how to say it, human initiated way. Uh, some species uh, can go between the continent by the sea as well. Let's, let's say uh, years ago, hundreds of years ago, uh, black mice were actually infested ships that were going from one state to the other. And uh, our recent research that we didn't publish yet, but we're going to, detects the, present of the presence of species that is, was very similar to the Japanese Brella Garini in the southeastern United States. And very deep phylogenetic analysis and some kind of reconstruction, time reconstruction, showed that the time when this species moved from Japan to the southeastern United States really correlate with the expedition of American sailor, uh, Perry Matthew, on a boat. And actually there's an evidence that those ships that were going to Japan and back were infested with black mice as well. So a little bit about science, no more theory. How it all started. It's when the dick bites the, uh, the host, let's say host, not human. It actually uses the hypostome to disrupt the skin. And just try to imagine if you will take a needle and will pinch yourself, you feel pain, you feel irritation, you feel maybe not itching, but when a mosquito will bite you, you will feel all those stuff. And actually, the first step to protect the host from rejecting or cleaning the body from the tick, tick need to uh, provide a safe way for a long-term feeding. Hard ticks, like exodus recently, exodus capillaries, they are uh, supposed to feed at least seven days to full engorgement, to be able to uh, go through one developing stage to the other. So actually, this part of the body is very important for the beginning of uh, transmission of pathogens. And before the ticks start to feed, it will spill saliva into the host. And saliva contains a cocktail of uh, different molecules that will reduce the pain, itching, inflammation, and actually it will reduce the immune response of the host. I would like to show you, so our colleagues, this is the uh, uh, results of our colleagues. What they did, they tried to do a reconstruction of this part of the body using the special technique. They were cutting, 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 cutting this hypostome very thinly, and they reconstructed 455 micrometers of the tick hypostome using the scanning electron microscope. After they cut all this hypostome and they made uh, the pictures on scanning microscope, they put all over everything back together and can I push it? This is the way how it looked. So this, this video, just imagine from the bottom, from the very top to the body, they're getting a different structure that exists in a tick that might be uh, involved in a saliva spilling and blood sucking. This is a picture of, hold on, this is a picture of a uh, tick that bites through the mice skin. And this is another 3D reconstruction. Be careful and pay attention to three groups of muscle. This is an estimation from our colleagues, how they see it, and as far as this is very, very natural. Can you believe? This is a hypostome. Helly, Sarah, and all the rest of the hypostome. Okay, this muscle, this is one of This is another group of muscles, and this is a third group of muscles. And right now, watch carefully. The first group of muscle, it pops to the saliva duct and pushes the saliva out of the tick. And right now, using two other group of muscles, tick actually start to pump the blood inside. So the first way 
at how the tick protects itself from being removed from the body. The rest is how he actually protects his life cycle. He needs energy, he needs blood. So this is how it works. And this is the way how I'm sure the Lyme disease pathogen is transmitted. Lyme disease is an infection disease that can usually be successfully cured by antibiotic therapy at the very early stages, very early stages of infection, targeting the replicative form of spirochete. However, there is always however. There are millions of however that might actually uh, lead to failure of this treatment. Current antibiotics are efficient in killing of growing replicative form of spirochete, but they have rather insufficient activity against non-growing persistent forms. Success of Lyme disease therapy depends on how early antibiotic treatment is started. The question is how early is early enough to start the antibiotic treatment to ensure the elimination of the replicating forms of spirochete in an infected host. When you work with a tube in a lab and you are growing a culture, and sometimes it's really a pleasure to uh, check those spiral forms, how matiles they are, how beautiful they are, truly beautiful. But after a week or so, you can find the different uh, forms of the spirochete. So the culture is getting older, like aging is a lifestyle. <laughs> we, we cannot reject this. And at one moment, you see very few spiral metal uh, forms, but you can see all those forms that Leona was talking about. Round bodies, spirochets with blebs, biofilms. A group of Professor Zhang published this paper in 2015, actually trying to uh, analyze the different uh, antibiotics no normally used for treatment of Lyme disease parakeet, working with culture in vivo, in vitro, sorry, in vitro, in a tube. And if you can see, I hope you can see, and I'm sure you know this paper. This is the only one uh, part with a triple doxycycline daptomycin cefaparazone, where you can see a leaf green lighting spirochet. The rest of combination of single monotherapy treatment failed. What does it mean? It means that after the treatment, the number of the percentage of residual cell was high enough. And after cultivation seven and 15 days, you can see the growing of uh, multiplication of spirochets only, triple combination, keep the number of spirochets at the same level. So the question is, is, is it definite? Is it not definite? Why they are not growing? Are they dead? Or are they just in a latent state, dormant state, persistent state, and they will wake up later, which is possible. We decided to try something on mice, on laboratory mice, because as long as everything is done in vitro, it stays on speculation level. We selected uh, Braille laboratories and so stricter strain that was originally isolated from Ixodes rhizinus, which belonged to OSPC type B, which is the second most infective uh, uh, OSPC type uh, that are recognized. And we know from our earlier work that that strain is able to disseminate into the secondary body. It was not just detected in an air, but in bladder joint on the heart. So name wise, we infected with young replicating culture and four weeks later we confirmed the presence of infection by PCR in mice ear. After that we started to treatment, that was a pilot experiment, still is a pilot experiment. We treated some mice with doxycycline and amoxicillin, double antibiotic, there was healthy control and infected control. We tried to calculate the dose of antibiotic somehow related to uh, the dosage that human accept during the monotherapy or treatment of Lyme disease. So after the end of antibiotic treatment, all mice were dissected, blood and tissue samples from each mice were collected. So we picked up tissue, bladder, spleen, heart, brain, and joint. And we didn't do any PCR reaction. We put it in a liquid media to prove that uh, infection is real and the spirochet can grow. Surprisingly, in addition to control 
mice where spirochetes were detected in blood, bladder, brain, and joint. The mice that was treated with the mice that were treated with amoxicillin, all three of them were culture positive from bladder and from joint, and two of them in brain. Doxycycline treatment show us, gave us the growing culture from bladder tissue and from joint. And double treatment, we detected a leaf spirochet with isolated leaf spirochet cultured from joint tissue. Again, culture is a good thing, but do we want to know more? The samples were given to our colleagues from the uh, laboratory of, of electron microscopy, and they've been using correlative light electron microscopy to prove if there are any leaf spirochet definitely can be detected in mice tissues. So they've been using fluorescent microscopy, to, oh, excuse me, to find, to find the structure of interest, and after that they've been using transmission electron microscopy to uh, get a closer look. So that's how it works. You can see a glass with joint, cut it on a special microtome. Then after the uh, structure of interest was defined, it was put into special rhizin, and the rhizin was cut, it, and this small area was analyzed on transmission electron microscopy. So first of all, we analyzed infective control, just to prove that Borelli is present there and that is present in a leaf form. If you can see, Borrelia is in green. It's very badly seen here. It's here, it's here, and it's spiral. Another group of untreated infective control, the site of interest, and we can see the presence of Borrelia, and again, in a spiral form in it. Then we move to amoxicillin-treated mice. So this is a bladder tissue. It's a blood vessel, and this is how Borrelia look in mice after antibiotic treatment, with, uh, after amoxicillin treatment. The same mice, different picture, it's erythrocytes, and the spirochet, that is definitely not spiral. The same mice, and this is a joint cut, so you can see the present of not spirochet, uh, not, not spiral, but definitely spirochet looking creature. This is another mice, again, it's treated with amoxicillin, and this is the structure of interest that definitely is a uh, cyst of Borrelia burgdorferi. The same mice, and right here we can see rather fat spirochet looking like a creature, and the measurement showed that most probably uh, those are two spirochets that are swirled uh, one around another. And this is doxycycline treated mice. And the structure of interest, according to labeling, is Borrelia burgdorferi. So I'm grateful to Marina Golochka, who is here with me, for all the laboratory work, and she's co author of this presentation. Maria Vansova Tamashbili Yerivanechik from Laboratory of Electron Microscopy for letting us to present the unpublished result. Hannah Sekedeva for Be Imaging Help. Daniel Ruzek for a picture of tick that is a bit from through the uh, mice. And Michael Tlusti, this is a guy who actually made this reconstruction of results of scanning electron microscopy to this nice and scary picture. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, a such a wonderful talk. I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone I'm working with ticks. I don't know ticks. But anyway, um, my question is, um, do you know how long does it take for the Borrelia to be transferred from the ticks into the blood? So this is, hello, hello, can you hear me? So this is actually a very controversial uh, topic. You, some people uh, would like to say, you need to have tick at least 48 hours to secure the transmission of Borrelia. Other people 
will publish results, they will say, I guess that 12 hours is enough. There were some publications that uh, were talking about three hours. Uh, time for uh, actual transmission of spiracate. But there is one more way how to look at it. Actually, as a group of our colleagues from our institute, we're working with Braille Laboratory for Census uh, Strict Agrinia and FZLA. And what they found that while Borrelia gorinia and sensus stricta is located in the mid-gut of unfed tick, Borrelia abzeli is located in salivary gland. It means that when ticks start to suck blood, those species that are uh, staying in mid-gut, they need time to wake up, to go through gamma lymph, to mid the salivary gland, and go to infected host. But Borrelia abzeli, that already stays in uh, salivary gland. It needs just a few minutes to be spilled with a, in the, just in the first moment of tick bite. It can go from uh, salivary gland to the patient. So it means that the, to answer correctly, what kind of, uh, what time do you need for spiracate to move? You need to be more precise. How much time each and every species requires to move from unfed tick to uh, the host during the blood feeding. Brilliant, sir. I just have a very quick one. You have this lovely picture with old animals and the three Borrelia strains, yep. Burgdorferi, Abzali, Agarinii. And it seems like Burgdorferi is more toxic. It can no, 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 no. In the United States, by the way, this is the only uh, species that cause every damage in patients, which I always was fascinated. Why? How is it that European sensor stricta is so unable to cause all kinds of clinical manifestation? Why in the United States they need only one spiracate to cause neurobrilliosis and erythema migrans and whatever, whatever, whatever. No, actually, uh, sensor stricta in Europe, I think, is overlooked. Right. It is distributed uh, much wider than we would like to accept. Because, again, this is our kind of mind. We... Uh, Rather say that there is only three uh, species that cause Lyme disease in Europe when it's already 10. And in the United States, they recognize one plus myoni, uh, but they don't speak about Borrelia bicetii that was proven to be uh, detected in patients from California by a group of uh, Bob Lane. And actually, we found uh, Borrelia bicetii like species in a patient, we isolated it in patient from uh, Florida. Thank you. Uh, Borrelia bicetii like. But actually, it was Borrelia bicetii like by, uh, by phylogenetic analysis, but when we did uh, whole genome sequencing, it appears that this strain is located between Borrelia bicetii and Borrelia carolinensis. Two of those species genetically are very close. So at the moment, we're not sure if it's still Borrelia bicetia like or it's already the first mention of, uh, let's say, connection of Borrelia carolinensis with human health. So we're working on it right now. The whole genome sequence is on the way, so we'll answer later. <laughs> I have a question concerning the, the images where you, which you show that uh, uh, murine tissues uh, uh, after antibiotics still show uh, Borrelia. How were, maybe you said it, but I didn't get how the, these uh, Borrelia were labeled. That's, that was acrid and orange There's or anti, anti when OSPA? We, when we grow, okay, when, can we go back? Yes, we can go back. So when we, when we use a culture, it's easy, you don't have to... Uh, to label anything, but working with, so right here. There is a labeling, Antiborrelia, EGG, Alexa 488. This is a work of our uh, electron microscopic colleagues, and this is the way how they prove this labeling is work specifically. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, very interesting work. Yeah, so, thank you. I'm just wondering uh, what uh, you said. This is the antibody, anti malaria, uh, and anti Borrelia antibody. What's the specificity against? Uh, not, not my part of work. I would, I oh. would, I would send you the response uh, from our okay. colleagues. But this is the way. Uh, uh, 
uh, our collaboration works. They did their part, and we are doing the rest of the part. Okay. But I will definitely answer this question right. to you. How, how long did you treat in this case uh, the mice? 14, uh, 14 days. 14 Actually, days. it was nonstop. It was uh, antibiotics uh, were injected intraperitoneally because uh, it's really hard to give oral because okay, the mice I will see, spill. I see. So we've been just uh, diluting the antibiotic in 100 microliters of PBS and yeah. we're injecting it per 40 days, days in a row. Yeah. What is the dose of the antibiotics? What? What's the dose? So it was 71.5 uh, microgram of doxycycline and 625 of amoxicillin. This, this is the equivalent to what in terms of a milligram per kg? It's uh, 200, 200 micrograms per human twice a day, uh, the CDC uh, protocol, okay. something like this. So okay. We were just trying to right. keep it somehow in connection. When you did the infection of the mice, how old was the culture? So the culture was about five days, and it was double infection. We've been uh, injecting uh, um, on a skin, under the skin, on a neck, uh, 100 microliters and 100 intraperitoneally, and it was the culture was 10 to 4 spiracate in 100 microliters. Okay. So it was quite a boost of spiracate for mice, but we wanted to be sure that the mice will be infected. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.